Thank you uh, for being such uh, kind hosts. Um, it's been a tremendously um, beautiful experience for me being here and um, uh, and seeing seeing Gil again, who's somehow the connection between <laughs> all of us. Um, um, it's uh, it reminds me of of something that I'll talk about in fact today, of of uh, the things uh, one. Uh, always misses when uh, they are in perpetual exile, uh, meaning that uh, you're, never, you're never in a single spot. Uh, and and Gil has taught me a lot about, about, about that and uh, has opened up my mind in, in many, many ways that I can go on and on about, but I won't. Um, so <clears throat> what I will discuss today is not really urgent. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that uh, in urgency there's something abrupt and perhaps even what we can call new. Uh, it's not new. Um, uh, in any case, it is not urgent in another way as well. Uh, urgency in its simplest understanding presupposes uh, an answer, uh, something that is urgent like the very tragic floods uh, that um, that you're dealing with uh, in this country requires some sort of action, and we talked about action, but um, uh, yes, it requires some sort of action and it requires answers, not really philosophical musings. I'm not sure if I will provide uh, any definitive answers. Um, in fact, the, the more I feel I at least come um, close to a certain certainty uh, feeling that I have answers uh, to, to the questions that, that, that bother me and that I'm anxious about, the more anxious I become. Um, so um, questions really lead to more questions and, and, and these questions to more anxiety, which is of course crushing, but it's also productive. Um, and I'd like to be, be more clear about that so that I can um, um, get into my topic, I moved from Brown University about three and a half years ago. Uh, I was teaching in the Department of Comparative Literature there. Um, there I was perceived as a scholar of uh, mainly modern Greek studies who was also doing, uh, like most of us, some theoretical things. Um, but the identification was clear. Um, in Cyprus, things changed at the University of Cyprus when I moved for no particular reason. It just happened. I moved there. Um, the, the, um, the, the field is different. I'm known as the theory guy <laughs> um, who, uh, because everyone is doing modern Greek literature in my department, Byzantine and modern Greek. Uh, so, so what, what came to distinguish my work uh, has been theory. Um, the cultural context, the academic context is entirely different and that caused me to return to some questions, uh, some very basic uh, questions of how we do our work uh, when we work on, on national literatures on the one hand and theory on the other. So um, I have a whole, a whole thing here that I'm not going to get into because it's very powerful and it's going to, uh, I think, here's what I have. I'm not going to even dare to, 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 to go into the ninth thesis of, 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 of Benjamin, which is a, it's, it, it's, uh, uh, Nono read the eighth uh, thesis uh, yesterday. This is the ninth. And, but I, I can tell you very simply uh, that this, for me, is a good, um, it's a, it's a good explanation or a good metaphor, if you will, of, of, of uh, the state of theory as I experienced it um, uh, in the past few years, meaning, meaning that this um, uh, chain of events uh, that we see as history, and on the one hand, and this great catastrophe that is history that Benjamin talks about, seems to me uh, when we look back at theory uh, and, and, and all the kind of theoretical approaches we use to interpret texts or, 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 or other things uh, or, or other actions or gestures, 
um, uh, it seems it seems it often seems to me like they pile up in um, um, in 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 a heap of of, of, of rubble uh, rubble heap as as, as uh, Benjamin calls it, um, and I'm trying to make sense of that. So in order to make sense, let me begin by saying that I've thought a lot about post-structuralism, not in the specific uh, in any specific use of the term, but in the general sense of a kind of decentering, <coughs> meaning that. Post-structuralism, as you as you know, uh, it's a very general term that 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 uh, that is used in the academia to uh, refer to something, a process, uh, if you will, of uh, of not um, trusting uh, any definitive statements, whether they, whether these statements statements have to do with uh, ethics, with identity, uh, with uh, meaning. Um, and so on, desires, presuppositions, intentions. Uh, it's the challenging of the, of the very foundations of language. Um, it's uh, the way we talk when we do theory, which is, uh, not, I'm, I'm not being critical, this is something I do too. That's what I meant when I said I had to rethink about some of these, these things. The question of why are we using a kind of language that is very difficult um, uh, outside this room uh, for for uh, anyone to understand what we're talking about, uh, what what has uh, uh, led us to this point, and what is the function, and can we talk of an alter alternative language, uh, uh, perhaps? These I came face to face with when I went back to Cyprus. It's a, as I said, a vastly different academic environment. Um, uh, I guess we get a feeling of that when we teach. Uh, where we we're, we're obliged to be more uh, clear, um, uh, not so much in conferences, but in any case. <clears throat> um, so, uh, what I would like to do with that, with the notion of this decentering, post-structuralism, again, this very general understanding. Um, um, is, is uh, kind of paired with this notion of, of, of the ethnic. A, and a cl clarification here, I call it the ethnic, uh, not for any uh, particular reason, except that in Greek, there is no uh, alternative word for, na for the nation, for nationalism, if you will. It's ethnos, we have no distinctions. distinctions. So it's, the nation is ethnos, Ethnicismos is nationalism. It's all, it all boils down to that term, uh, the, the ethnic, ethnos, right? Um, so one of the things that happened with the advent of uh, post-structuralist theory uh, is th this very challenge uh, of, uh, of, of, of the nation, of the national narrative, uh, and of doing um, of interpreting li literature in the, uh, uh, let's call it, in the traditional way of, of uh, seeing the, the nation's narrative through this literature. Um, literature in this context, uh, among other things, is perceived as an ideological vehicle of the nation state, of the state. Um, and of course, you can see that in the way uh, literature has been appropriated by, say, the state in secondary, in primary and secondary education. So, if you go, if you look at some cases, this is, I'm so, sure, is something that you you're familiar with. If you look at some cases um, across the world uh, of the attempt to revise history books in the past, just the past decade, it's impressive to see how many controversies arise from this uh, attempt. Um, there have been such attempts in Japan, in Albania, um, in India, and of course uh, in Greece. Um, in Greece, the attempt to change history books, uh, give an alternative version of history, has been met with uh, a lot of resistance, um, particularly the events having to do with the uh, 1881 revolution against the Ottoman Empire, but also the civil war of the 1940s, uh, have been under scrutiny, and uh, um, again, any attempt to, to, to reconsider these events is met with um, uh, resistance. Um, now, the, the, uh, 
to add to that, there is, uh, as you again may know, a, a rise of the ultra-right in Greece. This is a phenomenon that we see across Europe, but um, uh, in Greece, it seems that a vacuum has been created uh, where uh, the, this kind of, and that's what, that's what I'm going to talk about, this kind of, of, of an approach of deconstructing the nation on the one hand, um, and as a reaction, uh, having these, 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 these uh, um, uh, conspiracy, if you, if you, if you will, uh, theory of, uh, not necessarily wrong, but this conspiracy theory of uh, external forces trying to alter, change our national narrative, um, has given way uh, to the rise of the ultra-right. People are more ambivalent, more reluctant to talk about the national narrative, and they find solace in the pro proclamations of the right, uh, which is much more, it, it articulates the national narrative in a, uh, in a very, very clear, uh, populist, of course, but very, very clear way. So um, let me transpose that to what it means for a field of studies, like modern Greek studies. In the 1990s, there was a turn in the field of modern Greek studies beginning in the United States where uh, a lot of scholars there uh, took up uh, post-structuralist theory and uh, approached different subjects through uh, many, many different uh, lenses, uh, but with a general uh, sense of, of, of a decentering, challenging dominant notion, notions uh, of, uh, of uh, what it means to do Greek literature. Um, so as one of the leading scholars uh, in the US um, uh, right, uh, wrote back then in 1997, Vasilis Lambropoulos is uh, who I'm talking about, um, the, um, the turn uh, to uh, post-structuralism in modern Greek uh, studies can be traced back to the 90s when scholars in the English-speaking world turned their attention away from monographs, uh, away from canonical literary works, to issues um, that concern the very core of post-structuralist discourse. So one quote that I would like to uh, uh, read with you is this uh, from Vasilis Lambropoulos' Modern Greek Studies in the Age of Ethnography. So he, he writes, Lambropoulos writes, 10 years ago, so he's talking about the late 80s, those of us advancing post-structuralism within literary studies suggested that a timely opportunity was presenting itself for exploring the specificity and difference of Greece, as well as its discursive construction. Today, that suggestion has come true with a vengeance. Modern Greek has been dramatically transformed into the study of Greek margins and aliens, linguistic, ethnic, religious, sexual, and other, documenting a long record of human rights abuses. Greek ethnography has dedicated itself overnight to the systematic advancement of the interests of marginalized mi minorities of all uh, persuasions, avant-gardists, outcasts, leftists, women, patients, the poor, gays, Albanians, Pontiacs, Jehovah's Witnesses, refugees. It is not an exaggeration to say that uh, taking apart dominant notions of Greek identity has now become the major project uh, in the field. And this is someone who actually used and uses um, um, post-structuralist discourse in his, in his work. The tr so the uh, problem with this um, approach, of course, especially in a, in a country like the United States where programs are established, in fact, based on funds that the community gives, um, imagine if you're deconstructing the national narrative and uh, you, you expect uh, the people in the community to, to give funds to sustain a modern Greek studies program. Uh, there was a conflict there. And uh, um, you, you, this kind of approach, uh, they realized, these scholars realized, leads to the dissolution of modern Greek studies altogether. Um, if if uh, the deconstruction, deconstruction of the nation um, leads somewhere is, I mean, why would someone do specifically modern Greek studies. So Lambropoulos says we might as well turn to um, uh, uh, this, a celebration of modern Greek studies without 
uh, the aesthetic uh, uh, judgments of the past. So do it a little differently. Uh, so what he says is we need uh, a history of heroes, of achievements, of virtues, of important works, of effective innovations, of beautiful structures, a history of freedoms, equalities, values, and distinctions. Too optimistic for me, but uh, in any case, uh, what um, I wanted to show in, in reading this to you, Lambropoulos' suggestion, is this kind of anxiety of what, what do you do in this theoretical environment with an ethnic field, with a, with a, a, a national literature. Um, so, uh, what strikes me, and I see it even more emphatically now that I have uh, returned, um, is how much any kind of utterance, any kind of statement about Greek literature uh, in uh, the Greek university setting is concerned uh, actually with the idea of the nation. And to make uh, uh, um, this clear, I can say, f f for example, that you would not imagine the use of, uh, say, Walt Whitman in America um, as emblematic or uh, uh, you wouldn't deconstruct the poetry of Walt Whitman in America in order to deconstruct the national narrative. Uh, this is in fact the case, this is in fact the canon uh, in Greece. There's a, a certain anxiety that has to do with the connection between literature and uh, national, uh, the national narrative. Every, uh, the questions that are being asked uh, are precisely what connects literature to the national narrative. Um, the, the, I will uh, give you a very specific example um, here. And I, I'm sorry, parenthetically, I should say that I understand this kind of anxiety as, as, as very natural, uh, especially when one thinks um, of Franz uh, Fanon's point about uh, col the colonized nations um, uh, projection of a relationship between literature and national uh, culture, uh, nations uh, that perceive them, themselves under th threat. Um, and I say this because uh, there's a lot, a lot of work uh, done on, on, on the relationship between Europe and Greece um, as a colonial relationship. Stathis Woodward is, is, was one of the first to, do, in fact, do that uh, in his dream nation. Um, uh, so let me focus on a very specific example. One of the most important generations of writers in Greece um, is the generation of the 1930s. Uh, English-speaking audiences may recognize uh, George Seferis, for example, uh, or Odysseus Elitis, uh, that I have been working a lot um, uh, on, his, on his work, um, because they both received Nobel Prizes, They've been translated wi widely. Uh, so two very well-known poets that belong to this, this same generation that is active, beginning to be active in the 20s and especially in the 30s. Um, now, this is a generation that, uh, what did they, why are they so well-known in Greece? Why are they so important in Greece? They're very important in Greece because this, uh, uh, their approach, uh, created a kind of rupture in, in, in the way Greeks, uh, Greek poets uh, saw themselves and their uh, position as Greek poets. In other words, um, they argued that we should move away uh, from European stereotypes about Greekness that always filtered an understanding, uh, filter us through the lens of us Greeks, right? Filter us uh, uh, through the lens of antiquity. They always understand us through antiquity. And there was a move away from that uh, towards uh, um, an understanding of contemporary Greek culture. What did that mean? It, means, it meant that they turned uh, to tradition, for example, uh, in order to rediscover uh, uh, a kind of lost, uh, lost uh, um, uh, image of, 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 of the homeland. Um, and they strongly emphasize the connection between land. This is not, uh, of course, exclusive to the Greek case. It's, uh, it's very common, a connection between land and the people. Um, so um, 
At the same time, I should say that this is a generation that, I that is uh, very heavily modernist in the sense that there are they follow developments in the West. Uh, Elite is, uh, is immersed in surrealism, into the movement of surrealism in the 1930s. Uh, George Seferis is very close to T.S. Eliot uh, and so on. But uh, a very good example of this turn away from the West is uh, Elite, Odysseus Elite's first collection is, uh, the title is, or his title is, or, uh, is uh, 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 Prosanatolismi. Uh, which uh, means something like, like orientations, pros anatolismi, but in Greek, pros means towards anatolismi, uh, anatoli, as you know, it's uh, the east. So towards the east, away from the west, towards uh, the east. It was an attempt to change the way um, uh, Greek uh, poets, Greek writers perceived themselves. There are many such examples. I'll give you a second one. Uh, this is a generation that uh, suddenly turns towards the islands. They write a lot about islands. Back then, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous to write about islands, especially imagine that in the, in the modernist tradition, in the, moder the, the tradition of the city, right? Um, there's a lot of, in, in the 1930s, there's a lot of uh, literature that emerges um, about uh, uh, Greek islands. And of course, that's part of what I was saying, a turn to tradition, a turn to forgotten territories uh, of Greekness, let's, let's say. Now, recently, this is a narrative that many scholars in Greece have attempted to uh, revise, uh, to reconsider, to criticize. Um, there's many books. I mentioned um, a professor at the University of Athens, Anna Zuma, who uh, wrote a book titled A uh, Hundred Years of Nostalgia, the Autobiographical Narrative of the Nation, where she argues that the generation of the 1930s propagated hegemonic ideology, uh, which she hegemony here she equates with national identity, uh, first by associating Greekness and geography, therefore saying that these uh, uh, poets, by connecting geography, the land, uh, to identity, national identity, what they did, what they did was to naturalize, um, was to naturalize um, uh, national identity. It's natural to be Greek because you live here. Um, uh, second, uh, um, she argues, uh, well, OK, I won't get into that. But there's many more examples. Haris Vlavianos, a, a well-known scholar and a better-known poet in Greece, recently even attempted to uh, connect uh, the poetry of the burning of books during Nazism uh, to uh, the kind of ideology that he considers to be very uh, nation-centered. Um, so he's connecting uh, the uh, poetry of elitists to, uh, to Nazism. Um, a more serious attempt, um, I mean, these are extreme exa examples. Not that the third is not extreme, but I'll try to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Antonis Liakos, um, I don't know if some of you might know Antonis Liakos. He's a, uh, uh, the best known professor um, uh, of history in, at the Pantheon University in, uh, in Greece. Um, and he's been leading this kind of attempt to deconstruct the national narrative. That's what he does. Um, so uh, here's, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a, a passage so that you see um, how uh, uh, this process unfolds that I translated. Here it is. Through these experiences, and he talks about the, the period, the experiences leading to the generation of the 30s, um, through these experiences came first a popular reading of the hegemonic scheme of history, as, and secondly, a connection between history and aesthetics. I'm trying to, to read this carefully, a connection between history and aesthetics. The popular reading of history meant a plot in which the Greek people were the victims of foreign intervention and popular efforts for progress were frustra frustrated by the opposed regimes. The Marxist and anti-imperialist spirit of this time is obvious in this reading. The connection between history and aesthetics meant 
the historization of aesthetics and the aesthetization of history. This is not as difficult as it may sound. In fact, it's very simple what he's saying. But uh, the discourses during the interwar years about Elinicotita, the equivalent of Hispanidad or Itali Italianita, resulted in a search for authenticity in the tradition and contributed to a consideration of history as part of the aesthetic canon, from the high cultural activities to popular entertainment, the po modernist poetry of Yanis Rizzos, Seferis, Elitis, and the popularization of poetry through the music of Mikis Theodorakis and Manos Hadzidakis in the post-war uh, period spread this uh, sentimental uh, affection uh, for national uh, history. So um, the major problem that I see here uh, with Lyakos's reading uh, is linked to the old Marxist question, in fact, of the relationship between aesthetics and history. Um, so anyone familiar with non-canonical uh, uh, literatures uh, will inevitably have to come to terms with the overt link between uh, national culture or identity and aesthetics. Uh, this is something I imagine that this is what Partha Chatterjee means when he says that um, uh, colonized nations uh, turn to tradition during uh, periods of uh, 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 insurrection. Uh, this is a kind of turn to tradition that enables uh, uh, resistance to what they see as, 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 as um, um, as a, a power that is much more advanced technologically, therefore, how do you deal with this? You deal with it through tradition. You deal with it through um, spirituality, uh, that we have a culture, we have a tradition. You might have technology, but we have this, this kind of pride, right, in the, in the, in the uh, in, in national uh, uh, culture. Um, again, uh, we might think uh, as that, that, that essay that was criticized much, but and nevertheless I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention it, um, by Jameson, Frederick Jameson, Third World Literature at the Age of uh, Multinational Capitalism, where uh, this is what he, precisely what he uh, tries to understand, the connection between uh, literature uh, in what he calls the third world and, um, and, um, uh, and aesthetics. Uh, that there's a, a strong preoccupation, right, with um, with uh, with uh, the nation in these um, places. Um, so, Fanon writes that the link between national culture and the people's understanding of their literature um, and uh, resistance to um, hegemonic impositions is a, a presupposition for resistance to colonialism. Uh, so far from being autistic, self-absorbed, backwards, the literature produced in these uh, places frantically, frantically attempts, first and foremost for me, to place peripheral cultures on the map. This is what Fanon was writing vis-a-vis -vis Algeria. If culture is the expression of national consciousness, I will not hesitate to affirm that in the case which, uh, with which we're dealing, it is na the national consciousness which is the most elaborate form of culture. National consciousness, which is not nationalism, he says, is the only thing that will give us an international dimension. It's the only thing that will give us an international dimension. Um, so to dismiss national literatures as m mere vehicles of the nation state, uh, is, um, in a sense, absurd. Um, so one thing that I'm, that I'm preoccupied with is this connection, this critique of the connection between land and poetry, land and, um, land and, and geography. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at different literatures, uh, look, at them, look at them comparatively, um, in the context that I've been talking about, a kind of anxiety about what it means to be a Greek, what it means to be uh, Chilean, what it means to be uh, uh, to live in a certain uh, uh, space and occupy a certain culture, um, uh, uh, that you find these examples uh, all over the place, in a kind of celebration of the land. Uh, 
Uh, and it doesn't matter from which ideological uh, political position. Uh, the poetry of Neruda, Canto General, is full of these uh, uh, celebrations of identity in connection to the land. Uh, just one example before I move to a, a last example to show you a kind of my, my kind of my way of dealing with this anxiety. Um, uh, Neruda. Uh, this is Canto General uh, about Chile. Every night I read your description, your rivers, they guide my dream, my exile, my frontier. He's talking about his country. I love even the roots of my cold country. This is what I'm saying. It would be an oversimplification to deconstruct these as a, in the context of uh, uh, a grand national narrative that needs to be deconstructed. Uh, so I will read, I'll finish by, because uh, I don't have much time, um, Tanya tells me. So I will read, uh, I will read this. This is Odysseus Elitis, uh, as I said, a, po a poet that I've been working a lot on. And what I, what, I, what I want to emphasize here is that this sort of anxiety of dealing with the nation um, on, the, uh, on, on the one hand, but undoing that and doing that at the same time. Um, if you read closely, it's, uh, it's there in a lot of uh, poetry. It will make more sense if we read it first and then I'll say a couple of words and close. So this is from The Little Seafarer, a collection that comes out in the 1980s, early 1980s. And here, uh, there's a narrative in this collection. Um, uh, he follows this character that he calls the, the poet, follows this character that he calls The Little Seafarer, and uh, through an exploration of identity. Um, so this is one of the prose poems of the collection. I resided in a country that came from the other, the real one, as a dream comes from the facts of my life. I too named it Greece, and I drew it on paper so I could look at it. It seemed so little, so elusive. As time went by, I kept trying it out with certain sudden earthquakes, certain old thoroughbred storms. I kept changing the position of things to rid them of all value. I studied the vigilant and the solitary so that I might be found worthy of making brown hill crests, little monasteries, fountains. I even produced an entire orchard full of citrus trees that smell of Heraclitus and Archilochus. But the fragrance was so strong, I got scared. So I very slowly took to setting words like gems to cover this country I love. Lest someone sees beauty or suspect that maybe it does not exist. That's a brilliant poem for me because it really captures this, this, this very anxiety that I'm talking about. The connection between what we feel, what we, what we feel, the connection that we might feel to a certain concept like this, a country, um, which is very real. And, and, and one, it's one that one has to recognize and, 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 and understand uh, from the grand narrative of what he calls the real country, the real Greece. Um, uh, there's a connection between the two, obviously. Um, I mean, it comes, um, it came from the other, the real one, as the dream comes from the facts uh, of my life. What I particularly like about this code is a trying out the kind of testing of, 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 your, of your presuppositions or suppositions of what it means to be Greek, what it means to be uh, anything really. But here, he tries it with earthquakes, as he says. Uh, and of course, the very end, uh, or suspect, suspect. So once one should ask here, what does he think? Does it exist or not? That's it.